order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Janet Davy. Yeah. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Thank you. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm sure that the whole House will wish to join me in offering our heartfelt condolences to the family and friends of Guardsman Matthew Talbot of the 1st Battalion Coldstream Guards, who has sadly died during anti-poaching operations in Malawi. Mr Speaker, members across the House, I'm sure, will also want to join me in sending my very best wishes to their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, on the birth of their son. Monday marks the beginning of Ramadan, a time of peace, devotion and charity. And I know that members from across the House will want to join me in saying to Muslims in the UK and across the world, Ramadan Kareem. And later today, I will be hosting a reception to celebrate for Saki and to celebrate the immense contribution that the Sikh community makes to this country. And Mr Speaker, this week marks 20 years since the 1999 Scottish Parliament and National Assembly for Wales elections. Two decades on, we remain committed to strengthening devolution within the United Kingdom. And as we leave the European Union, we will bring new powers and responsibilities to Holyrood and Cardiff Bay. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Janet Davey. Thank you, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I agree with all the tributes made by the Prime Minister. Data from the TUC suggests that 780,000 people are on zero-hour contracts, with two-thirds of those preferring guaranteed hours. A constituent of mine lives in a privately rented accommodation and works two jobs on zero-hour contracts. After getting his third job on a zero-hour contract, his rent went up. He and his family survive, but only with the use of a local food bank. Will the Prime Minister end these burning injustices yeah. and ban zero-hour contracts? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, the party that recognised an issue about zero-hour contracts was the Conservative Party in government. The Labour Party did nothing about zero-hour contracts. It was the Conservatives that banned exclusive zero-hour contracts. Thank you, Mr Speaker. School funding on the doorsteps in Lewis is a huge issue, and that's because historically schools in Lewis have had significantly less funding for decades compared to neighbouring authorities like Brighton and Hove. Last year, schools in Sussex got a 6% increase in funding, and this year, schools like Lewis Priory should be getting a 7.6% increase in their per pupil funding, but £64,000 of that is being kept behind by the Council. Will the Prime Minister do all she can to ensure the schools get the funding that they've been awarded? I think my, my honourable friend has raised a very important point because we have recognised uh, that we've been asking schools to do more. We've responded to that with the highest level of school funding on record. We've introduced the uh, new national funding formula to make the distribution fairer. But of course, it is still the case that the local authorities are responsible for determining individual schools' budgets from the overall sum that they have received. And they have a responsibility. And uh, honourable members, I'm sure, will look to their local authorities to make sure that where schools should be receiving extra money, the local authorities are passing it on. But I will also ask the Department of Education, who will have heard the Honourable Lady's question, to write to her in more detail about it. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in sending condolences to the family and friends of Guardsman Matthew Talbot, who died whilst on anti-poaching activities. It is a reminder of the diverse work that the armed forces do, and I think we thank them for it and the help they're giving to the people of Malawi. I join her also in welcoming welcoming the birth of the baby to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, and that she, along with all of us, are recognising and enjoying Ramadan and Vasaki at this time. It's important to show the diversity of this country and celebrate all religious festivals. Uh, Mr Speaker, I hope the whole House will also join me in congratulating a great football team. <laughs> Manchester City on winning the Women's <laughs> FA Cup. <coughs> and um, in view of the... Um, in view of the amazing performance of uh, Liverpool last night, perhaps the Prime Minister could take some tips from Jurgen Klopp on how to get a good result in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, are, are 
Our National Health Service is our country's greatest social achievement. Its staff show amazing dedication, but this government's failures are taking their toll. An NHS staff survey found that 40% of staff have reported suffering work-related stress in the last year alone. Mr Speaker, can the government explain why they're being so severely let down by this government? Yeah. Can I first of all say to the right honourable gentleman, I actually think that uh, when we look at the Liverpool win over Barcelona last night, what it shows is that when everyone says it's all over, that your European opposition have got you beat, the clock's ticking down, it's time to concede defeat, actually we can still secure success if everyone comes together. The right hon the, the hon right gentleman asks about staffing in the NHS. What we see in relation to the NHS workforce is that for too long governments have failed to produce the proper workforce planning to give our staff in the NHS the care that they deserve. It is this government, with its long-term plan, that is ensuring that we are giving that care to staff. The NHS staff work hard caring for patients. This government will care for NHS staff. It's only because we're able to give the NHS its biggest cash boost in its history, we're only able to give it that long-term plan that we will deliver for NHS staff. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, under the last Labour government, NHS investment rose by 6% a year. Under this government, it's barely reached 1.5%. And... 5,000 nurses and midwives from European Union countries have left the NHS in the past two years, and there are 100,000 staff vacancies across the NHS in England alone. The Royal College of Radiologists recently said that the shortage of cancer doctors puts care at risk. What is the Prime Minister doing to remedy this dangerous situation? To the right honourable gentleman, what have we seen this year? What we have seen this year is oh, just, no. what we've seen this year is the numbers of doctors and nurses in the NHS at their highest level in its 70 year history. As I say, our NHS staff work hard 24 7 and their dedication is second to none. I'm proud of our NHS. He talks down our NHS. Let's just Let's just remember, let's just remember this. At the last general election, at the last general election, the Labour Party promised to give the NHS less money than the Conservative government is giving them. The Labour Party in government would crash the economy, which would mean less money available for the NHS. And who are the only party in government that has cut funding to the NHS? The Labour Party. Mr Speaker, nobody on this side of the House ever talks down the NHS. It's Labour's, it's Labour's greatest achievement. The principle, the principle of health care, free at the point of need, as a human right, was a Labour achievement. And they voted against it. And every Tory MP voted against it. T today, Mr Speaker, is world... Today, Mr Speaker, is World Ovarian Cancer Day, for which early diagnosis, like all cancers, is essential. In February, almost a quarter of patients waited more than two months to start cancer treatment following a GP referral. The worst performance on record. Will the Prime Minister apologise to those thousands of cancer patients enduring weeks of unbelievable stress and worry whilst they're waiting to start the treatment they should be able to start quickly after they've been referred in order to have a better chance of survival? Yeah. Well, we we recognise the importance of early diagnosis and early treatment and uh, in ovarian cancer and in other cancers and in other conditions as well. That's why a key part of the 10-year plan, the long-term plan for the NHS, which is being put forward under this government, is about that early diagnosis. We recognise the importance of that. 
But the right honourable gentleman might just like to reflect on the fact that there is a part of the United Kingdom where the urgent cancer treatment target hasn't been met since June 2008. Where is that? In Wales, under Labour. Jeremy Corbyn. Under the NHS in Wales, Mr Speaker, more people are surviving cancer than ever before, and I think we should welcome the work that they've done. Mr Speaker, the Royal College of Radiologists said our workforce projections are increasingly weak. Almost half of all women with ovarian cancer reported having to visit the GP three times before they actually got referred for a test. And today we learn that GP numbers are experiencing their first sustainable fall for 50 years. GPs, Mr Speaker, are often the ones who play the vital role in early identification of cancers and other serious problems. Does the Prime Minister think it's acceptable that one third of people needing an urgent GP appointment on the day that they ask for one are being turned away because of the shortage of GPs? Can I say, right honourable gentleman, we recognise that GPs are a vital part of the NHS, and there are actually more GPs in the NHS today than in 2015. But we've also made it easier for people to access their GPs by ensuring that GP surgeries are open for more days of the week uh, so people can have that better access. We're incentivising GP trainees to work in hard to recruit areas and making it easier and quicker for qualified doctors to return to the NHS. And under our NHS long-term plan, we will see, for the first time in its 70-year history, the proportion of funding for primary medical and community care as a percentage of the uh, NHS budget increasing, for the first time in its 70-year history. That's because it's this government that recognises the importance of primary care in our National Health Service, and it's this government that's careful management of the economy means there's money available to put into our National Health Service. Jeremy Corbyn. To any A&E department in the country, you'll find they're under enormous pressure precisely because there is a shortage of GPs to see people in the first place. And the Conservative Secretary of State, whilst promoting private GP services, at the same time is overseeing the biggest drop in NHS GPs for 50 years. One in ten, one in ten GPs are now seeing twice as many patients as it is safe for them to do so. That is the pressure they are under. The NHS has failed to meet its NHS and its A&E waiting time target for nearly four years. In March this year, more than one in five patients waited more than four hours to be seen. Will the Prime Minister, on behalf of the government, apologise to tens of thousands of people waiting for too long in deep distress just to get seen at an A&E department because of the pressure they are under? Yeah. Can I say to the uh, right honourable gentleman? We recognise the importance of these targets in the NHS. That's why one of the elements of the 10-year long-term plan in the NHS, funded by the biggest cash boost in the NHS's history, given by this Conservative government because of its good management of the economy, is to ensure that we're improving those targets. But perhaps he would also, he would also like to stand up and apologise for the fact that the A&E waiting time target hasn't been met not for four years, but for over a decade under a Labour government in Wales. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the reality is, under a Tory government, spending on the NHS and investment in it is less than it was under Labour, and even with her funding announcements, remains the same case. Mr Speaker, the complacent attitude and platitudes hide the reality that under the Tories our health service is going through the longest funding squeeze in history. 20,000 jobs in mental health units are unfilled. Public satisfaction at GP services is the worst on record. Cancer treatment delays are the worst on record. And A&E waiting times the worst on record. And Tragically, infant mortality is rising. Will the Prime Minister admit the government has failed the health service, failed NHS staff, and therefore failed the patients who rely on the NHS? Yeah. There, are, there are more people alive today because of our cancer treatment has improved uh, than would have been in 2010. 
And at the last general election, somebody said the following. They said that an extra £7 billion for the NHS would give our NHS the resources it needs to deliver the best possible care for patients. I wonder who that was. It was none other than the Leader of the Opposition. Is this government, is this government giving the NHS £7 billion? No. Is it giving it twice that? £14 billion? No. It is giving the NHS £20 billion. Pounds. I'm proud. I'm proud of this government's and the Conservative Party's record on the NHS. It's the Conservative Party that is giving the NHS its biggest cash boost in its history. It's the Conservative Party that's giving it a sustainable 10-year long-term plan to ensure it is there for people in the future. It's the Conservative Party that has seen more nurses, more doctors in our National Health Service dedicated to caring for patients. And that's only possible because it's the Conservative government that manages our economy, manages our public finances, and a Labour Party in government would crash our economy, meaning less money for the NHS, less money for its staff, and less care for its patients. Helen Waitley. Can I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the Duke and Duchess of Sussex on the birth of their son? Mr Speaker, wasn't it wonderful to see Prince Harry bursting with happiness as he shared the news with the nation? I do hope he'll be taking some time off to spend with Meghan and the baby. But statutory paternity leave is just two weeks and take-up of shared parental leave is low. So will my right of friend consider introducing a longer period of paid parental leave just for partners, which would be good for new dads, mums and their children. Well, my, my honourable friend has raised an important issue and I thank her for doing so and I recognise the importance of this for many parents. Obviously, currently parents can use the shared parental leave and pay scheme to take up to six months off work together if they wish or to stagger their leave and pay so one of them is always at home with their child in the first year. But we are evaluating the shared parental leave and pay scheme. We want to see how we can improve the system for parents and uh, the business department hopes to publish findings on this issue later this year. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also congratulate the Duke and Duchess of Wessex and wish everyone that's had a part of recent days. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the bog is the chronicle. Mr. Speaker, we had 113 days since the Prime Minister's deal was rejected by Parliament. Uh, members are rather overexcitable. The right honourable gentleman's question must and will be heard. Mr. Ian Blackford, Mr. Speaker. We had 113 days since the Prime Minister's deal was rejected by Parliament. A month of Tory talks with Labour, and we are still no further forward. The <coughs> clock is ticking down, and yet the Prime Minister is silent. When exactly will this House have an update from the Prime Minister? Can I, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, I'd hoped that he would join me in congratulating the Earl and Countess of John Dunbarton on the uh, birth of their child. The, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we are indeed, we are indeed, we are indeed uh, talking with the Labour Party. I think there's a very clear message that was given to this House last week from the public. It is that they want us to get on and deliver Brexit. Uh, I think it's absolutely right that we do so. And uh, we're working on an agreement that can, can, can command a majority of uh, this House. If the Right Honourable Gentleman is so keen for us to get on with delivering Brexit, why didn't he vote for the deal in the first place? Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, Scotland doesn't want a Labour Tory Brexit stitch up. Scotland voted to remain. And once again, with no Scottish representation in the talks, our nation is being ignored. Does the Prime Minister think this is good enough for a supposed union of equals? The Prime Minister must confirm today that any deal will be put back to the people for a final say. Say to the right honourable gentleman, as he knows, I've had talks with him in the past on the issue of the uh, of the Brexit deal. I've also discussed the matter with the First Minister for Scotland. Um, it's been made clear that uh, any discussions on these matters should be with the First Minister for uh, for Scotland. Um, in relation to the question of a second referendum, I remain absolutely of the view, as I have always been, and I'm not going to change my answer to him, that we should be delivering on the result of the first referendum that took place. Mark Menzies. 
Speaker, the whole House and indeed the nation knows sir, that you are an Arsenal superfan, but other teams are indeed available. And one such team is um, AFC Fylde that has reached Wembley not once but twice this season, Mr Speaker. So could I ask the Prime Minister to join me in congratulating and wishing AFC, AFC Fylde well, not just for the performance on the pitch, but for the excellent work they do in schools and with prisons in my community. And can I urge the Government to support them in their endeavours? Well, can I say to my honourable friend, it's absolutely right to congratulate AFC Fylde, I believe known as the Coasters, for their uh, recent success, and we wish them their best for their playoff final at Wembley. But AFC Fylde is a very good example of how clubs can engage with their local communities. We want to see this partnership taking place. It leads to excellent work being done in the communities. We're currently investing more money than ever before in community football programmes and f facilities, and we in fully intend the funding levels that go into this area to continue. So we have regular meetings with the FA and Premier League to encourage this activity at local level, but my honourable friend is absolutely right to congratulate AFC Fylde not only for their success on the pitch, but for the changes they are making to, other, to uh, lives in their community by the work they are doing in their community. Eleanor Smith. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Prime Minister, I am the co-chair of the APPG on Adult Social Care. I'd like to know when the long-awaited green paper on social care is going to be published. We've been waiting years for this. In January of this year, the Health and Social Care Secretary said it will happen before April. It's now May. Could you tell me when it will finally be available? Yeah. <laughs> can I say to the Honourable Lady, can I commend her for the work that she does on the, uh, on the APPG? And we are indeed working on, on uh, providing the Green Paper on social care. And she, uh, she complains that this has been delayed for a matter of months. Could I remind her that under the last Labour government, they had 13 years, 13 years to deliver a sustainable social care system. And and they did absolutely nothing. Sir Oliver Hill. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. the Prime Minister will be aware that many countries now require 10% of ethanol in petrol. In Britain, the effect of that would be to reduce emissions by the equivalent of 700,000 cars taken off the road and would also secure jobs in the ethanol plants of the northeast of England. Will the government move swiftly on this environmental measure so that we can have E10 here? Yeah. Can, I, can I say to my honourable friend, first of all, can I thank my right honourable friend for the work that the APPG is doing on this issue. Um, as he will know, uh, he just cited E10, it would help reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but it's not approved to be used in all petrol vehicles. And any decision to introduce the new grade of petrol must balance the needs of consumers with the emissions reductions it could help to, to deliver. But we will be publishing our next steps with regards to E10 petrol later in the year. And I'm sure that the Department for Transport will study with interest the findings that have come from the APPG's inquiry into this issue. Jane Ryan. Mr Speaker, people are fed up with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition blaming each other and only caring about a Brexit that suits them. Meanwhile, in Enfield, 34,000 children live below the poverty line and face a Brexit future that offers them nothing. Yep. Parliament is gridlocked. When will the Prime Minister do the right thing, go back to the country with a people's vote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, I've answered the question about a second referendum earlier, and my view hasn't changed in the few minutes since I answered that, uh, that question. I believe that we should deliver on the first referendum. But can I challenge her on what she said in her question? It is not right that outside the European Union, those children have no future. This country has a bright future outside the European Union, and that's the message she should be giving to her constituents. Sir Edward Lee. Today, the government introduces the Parliamentary Buildings Restoration and Renewal Bill. Is my right honourable friend aware of the growing concern at the demolition of the award winning listed Richmond House to make way for a permanent replica House of Commons where MPs could be parked for many years? Given the decant may now be delayed till 2028. Will her government ensure that for reasons of safety we get on with the work as quickly as possible and when a decant becomes necessary it is for as short a time as possible into a temporary cost-effective chamber? 
My, my, honourable friend has, my right honourable friend has raised an important issue because obviously this Palace of Westminster is recognised over the world as a symbol of democracy and obviously the decision that was taken by Parliament to approve the restoration and renewal programme was a huge step towards its protection. Um, he says we'll be introducing the bill uh, today which, and I'm pleased that we're able to do that. The decision to move to Richmond House was, of course, a matter for Parliament. Um, I understand that although Richmond House will be substantially redeveloped, the proposals will retain Richmond Terrace and the Whitehall facade. And I'm sure, as, as was indicated by my right honourable friend in, at the end of his question, that he will agree with me that it's imperative that Parliament keeps the total bill as low as possible. Andy Martin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituent, Carla Cotton, struggles with ME and fibromyalgia. Her eight-year-old son has severe hypermobility problems and cannot feed or toilet himself. When his higher rate DLA was stopped last August, Ms. Cotton also lost her carer's allowance and the severe disabled child element of child tax credit. Her appeal is not set to be heard until the end of this month. And in the meanwhile, her washing machine and oven are set to be taken away for non-payment of debt. What will the Prime Minister do to prevent families waiting for appeals falling into abject poverty? Obviously, the Honourable Gentleman has set out a very specific case, and I will ensure that the Department looks at that case. It is. I will ensure that the Department looks carefully at the case that he has set out. It is important, obviously we have been doing work, the DWP has been doing work, to ensure that appeals can be heard in a timely fashion to give people that confidence and reassurance. Rebecca Powell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the light of last week's debate in this place and the advice of the Climate Change Committee, could the Prime Minister indicate whether the Government will be legislating for net zero emissions by 2050? Can I say to, first of all, can I commend my honourable friend, who is a regular and consistent champion on these issues of environment and climate change, and uh, can I say to her that obviously we are looking at the re re um, result of the review that was taken by the Independent Committee uh, in relation to our uh, targets for the future. We have, I'm sure my honourable friend would agree, we have a good record in our decarbonisation that we have been and uh, uh, changes to emissions that we've been undertaking over recent years, and we will look very carefully and obviously make a formal response to that report in due course. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Sheffield, we've seen youth services cut by 64% as a result of the government's austerity agenda. At the same time, we are seeing an increase in knife crime. The APPG for Knife Crime, whose report was released yesterday, highlighted this link across the country. When will the Prime Minister recognise this is for real, that the decimation of youth services is leaving our young people vulnerable to crime? And what will she do to restore these vital services that should be there to support them? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, first of all, that we recognise the concerns about the, uh, uh, about the levels of knife crime. That is why, indeed, I will be chairing the first uh, serious violence task force uh, across government this afternoon, following on from the summit that we held a few weeks ago, uh, bringing all parts of government together to ensure that we are putting all efforts into dealing with this issue. There are various elements and diverse elements that need to be addressed in relation to this. It is the case that we do need to uh, ensure that we can uh, give young people, turn young people away from violence. There are various ways in that is being done, and that is uh, being provided across the country. And government is very clear of the need for us to work with local authorities and with others across the board in dealing with this very difficult issue. Raymond Chishti. Mr Speaker, I know the Prime Minister will welcome the news that Asha Bibi, who was persecuted for her faith, is on her way to Canada, who have offered her century. Can I ask this question to the Prime Minister? And I think everyone wants to know this answer from the Prime Minister. Why is it that Canada offered sanctuary to her and that the United Kingdom did not offer her sanctuary in the United Kingdom and that future such cases of religious freedom will be looked at differently by the United Kingdom? Well, can I join my honourable friend in welcoming the reports that Asya Bibi has been able to travel freely and is now able to make decisions about her own future? Our concern was always the safety and security of Asya Bibi. We were in close contact with the Government of Pakistan, but a range of international partners who were considering what the, uh, you know, the offers that would be available to Asya Bibi. Canada made this offer, and we felt it was right and appropriate that we supported the offer that Canada had made. I think that's important. 
Uh, he says, we have a proud record of welcoming people here who have been persecuted because of their faith, and, uh, and we will continue with that record. But in individual cases like this, I think it is important for international partners to work together with the key aim constantly of ensuring that the safety and security and best interests of the individual are what is put first and foremost. Dr. Rupa Hart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When 12-year-old Zach Gormley, a family friend, is the latest victim of an after-school mugging traumatising him, and in the same week another family is terrified by masked robbers in their own home, Leafy, Ealing and Chiswick feel like they're becoming the Wild West. The Prime Minister said austerity is over. So when will we get back the 21,000 police officers cut yeah. under her yeah. watch? Yeah. 300 yeah. locals. Yeah. Yeah. And the Honourable Lady knows that we're making around a billion pounds extra available for police uh, this year. That includes a significant amount of extra money that will be available for the Metropolitan Police. That extra money is being put into violence reduction units in hotspots around the country, which includes London, to ensure that we deal with this uh, issue of serious violence, which the government takes very seriously and uh, will be dealing with across in a number of ways and across government departments. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I say to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, she has tried her best. Nobody could fault or, or doubt her commitment and sense of duty, but she has failed. She has failed to deliver on her promises. We have lost 1,300 hardworking councillors, and sadly, the public no longer trust her to run the Brexit negotiations. Isn't it time to step aside and let someone new lead our party, our country, and the negotiations? First of, all, first of all, may I say to my honourable friend that I am sorry that we saw so many good Conservative councillors lose their seats last week, uh, very often for no fault of their own. I have been a councillor. I know the hard work and dedication that it takes. I have also been a councillor who has stood in an election against a difficult national background under a Conservative government, so I know what that feels like as well. Uh, and I thank all those councillors for their hard work, and I congratulate those Conservative councillors who won their seats for the first time across the country as well. Can I also say to uh, my honourable friend, um, actually, this is. No, wait for it, wait for it. Actually, this is not an issue about me, and it's not an issue about her. If it were an issue about me and how I vote, we would already have left the European Union. Uh, I'm pleased that the uh, Prime Minister acknowledged when prompted the achievements of Liverpool Football Club. I hope she also wants to congratulate Sheffield United on their rightful return to the Premiership yes, under the inspirational leadership of Chris Wilder. Yes, yes. But, Mr Speaker, in March I brought 14 Sheffield head teachers to meet the schools minister and deliver a letter to Downing Street signed by 171 of their colleagues. The reply didn't address their concerns that the 8% real cut in funding since 2010 has brought our schools to a tipping point, reducing subject choice, limiting support for special needs, unable to cope with growing mental health demands. The changes in the national funding formula don't address the crisis. Mm -hmm. So what will the Prime Minister do to ensure our children get the education they deserve? Yeah, yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, at risk of starting a trend, we've had Liverpool AFC filed, now Sheffield United. I'm happy to congratulate uh, uh, in the way that he, uh, he suggests. On the issue of education, as I've, as I've said, more money is available. We're making more money available in every area for every school. Uh, that is what this government is doing. In his own area, he sees several thousand more children in good and outstanding schools. That's important. The Labour Party may talk constantly about the money going into schools, but what matters is the quality of education that children receive. More children in his area in good and outstanding schools, the disadvantaged attainment gap narrowed, and more disadvantaged uh, young people going to university. That's a good record. It's a record this government can be proud of. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I too congratulate the Duke and Duchess of Sussex? Yeah. And as a former member of the Coldstream Guards, may I pass on my sympathy to Guardsman Matthew Talbot, who's recently been killed? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Can I congratulate the new Secretary of State for Defence for her new appointment? 
It is a highly privileged position to be in, and she will be responsible for sending our brave men and women into dangerous positions. To do that, she must gain their respect and get to know them. Does my right honourable friend agree that that is in itself a full-time job? Can I say? Can I? Can I first of all? Can I first of all take the opportunity my honourable friend has given me? to commend the former Secretary of State for Defence for his commitment to the armed forces and the men and women of our armed forces. My honourable friend is absolutely right that obviously as, a Secret as Secretary of State for Defence, my right honourable friend will be uh, needing to get to know the men and women of our armed forces. I have to say as a former Minister in the Department of uh, Ministry of Defence and a Na Royal Naval Reservist, I think, I think my right honourable sta friend starts from a very good position to do that. Can I also say to my honourable friend, in his, uh, the implication of his question, that there is a lot to be done in our armed forces on the questions of equality, and I think my right honourable friend is absolutely the right person to be dealing with that issue as well as ensuring that she is speaking up for and, uh, and promoting the best interests of the brave men and women of all our armed forces. Yay, uh, uh, Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp is an optimist, which is why he supports a public vote. And every football fan knows that the biggest prize lies in Europe. Yeah. There is no stable majority for her deal in this place without putting it back to the people. And even the former chair of her party, Eric Pickles, and members of the Eurosceptic ERG are now saying the same. Why does she persist in saying that they're all wrong and that she is right? And if she is right, what on earth is her plan? Yeah. To the Honourable Lady, that she makes it out as if I'm the only person across this House who thinks we shouldn't have a second referendum. In fact, this House has consistently rejected a second referendum. Dr Julian Lewis. Given the 2017 law requiring everyone in China to cooperate with that communist country's intelligence services, would it not be naive to the point of negligence to allow Huawei further to penetrate our critical national infrastructure, and shouldn't we be grateful to all those ministers, present and former, who have opposed this reckless recommendation? My friend, we are taking a robust risk-based approach that's right for our UK market and network and that addresses the UK national security needs. Um, the UK is not considering any options that would put our national security communications at risk, either within the UK or with our closest allies. No one takes national security more seriously than I do. And I say to my honourable friend, I think my record speaks for itself. On this side of the House constantly raise the burning injustices that are going unchallenged by this government. Yeah. Gender inequality, pay inequality, social inequality. And now we see yet another emerging inequality. The Centre for Towns has found that 55% of digital jobs are in the South East, with just 12% in the North. Is this Prime Minister going to do anything to help renew our post-industrial northern towns such as Lee? with the emerging digital and cyber sectors? Or has the Tory party psychodrama killed off any attempt at bringing together the North and the South? Yeah. Yeah. To the Honourable Lady. But it, it, is, it is under this government we see the lowest gender pay gap. It is this government that introduced the race disparity audit that is shining a light, finally, properly on public services and what is happening from people from different communities. And on the issue that she raises about jobs in the digital sector, uh, the industrial strategy has AI and digital as one of its grand challenges that it is dealing with. The industrial strategy is exactly about ensuring that this is an economy that works for everyone and that the sort of jobs that she is talking about are available for people across this country. Yeah, yeah. Martin Vickers. I was pleased to welcome the Prime Minister to North East Lincolnshire last Friday evening to mark uh, success in the local elections. I, and it's good to know that uh, the Cleethorpes constituency now has two Conservative-controlled unitary authorities. Yeah, yeah, the Prime Minister yeah, will recall yeah. that 
the uh, new uh, council leader, Philip Jackson, and I uh, mentioned to her the uh, Greater Grimsby Town deal, uh, and I know that uh, she will want to push that forward, as she's just said, as a part of the industrial strategy. Will she agree to facilitate meetings for me and the new council leader to push this forward? Yes. Can I, can I take a further opportunity to uh, congratulate the new leader of North East Lincolnshire, his new councillors and the whole council, Conservative Council group for taking control of North East Lincolnshire last week and indeed my honourable friend for the work that he did in campaigning to ensure that excellent result. Uh, he's absolutely right. He and uh, the council leader made that point about the town deal and I will indeed facilitate meetings between my honourable friend and the council leader and the ministers responsible. Samuel Roberts. And I call on this house to celebrate 20 years of devolution and I look forward to the nation of Wales taking our proper place among the nations of Europe. Yeah. Mr Speaker, 32-year-old Imam Shish of Newport is on his 143rd day of indefinite hunger strike today. The condition of his health is now critical. He is one of many Kurds on hunger strike around the world, including four others in the UK, protesting the treatment of Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan imprisoned in Turkey, whose human rights are clearly breached by the Turkish government. The Honourable Member for Newport East, 48 other MPs and Welsh Assembly members, and I have today written to the Foreign Secretary, asking him to apply pressure on Turkey to uphold the human rights of the Kurds. I am confident that the Prime Minister respects the urgency and the gravity of the situation. Will she please commit to intervening? Well, the Honourable, the Honourable Lady has raised uh, an important issue, and we absolutely expect Turkey to undertake any legal processes against prisoners fairly, transparently and with full respect for the rule of law, and that includes ensuring access to appropriate medical treatment. The British Ambassador in Ankara has discussed this wider issue of hunger strikes with the Turkish authorities, but we will continue to encourage the Turkish state to uphold the human rights of hunger striking detainees, including access to medical treatment. As she says, she and others have written to the Foreign Secretary, and I will ensure that the Foreign Secretary addresses that issue urgently. Andrew Salou. Our GPs are a very special group of public servants, and it's good news that we've recruited them in record numbers over the last two years. Will the Prime Minister do everything she can to make sure we look after their job satisfaction and specifically to help them with the pensions penalty, which some of them face in their mid-50s, which is driving some of them out of the profession. Well, can I th thank my honourable friend for his comments about GPs? They are indeed a vital part of our NHS. They are the bedrock of our NHS, and that is why, as I indicated earlier in response to the Leader of the Opposition, I think it is so important that the long-term plan includes that extra investment in primary and community care. Uh, the new historic five-year contract for general practice announced in January was developed in partnership with the BMS and it will provide greater certainty for GPs to plan ahead. But another way in which we can help those uh, GPs is funding, which we will see, towards up to 20,000 extra staff in GP practices, helping to free up doctors to spend more time with the patients who, uh, who need them. And as my honourable friend has indicated, we are committed to recruiting uh, more uh, GPs, an extra 5,000 GPs, as soon as possible, and to ensuring that they are able to maintain their careers and continue to provide the services to their patients that they do day in and day out. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Madam's Lead Detention Centre in my constituency was a living hell for the boys and young men sent there from across the UK in the 70s and 80s. Rape and torture were commonplace. So far, 1,800 men have bravely come forward to say they were affected. Some of those young men reported that abuse decades before the first person was convicted for some of those crimes committed. Nearly a year ago, I met with the Home Secretary along with a victim of abuse abuse at Medemsley to make the case for a public inquiry. Many of the victims are not covered by the inquiry into child sexual abuse because yeah. of their age. We need to know what happened at Medemsley. We need justice yeah. for survivors and we need to make sure it never happens again. Will the Prime Minister please say that we can have an independent public inquiry into the abuse at Medemsley Detention Centre? Yeah. Well, uh, can I say to the Honourable Lady that I take very seriously the issue that she has raised and, and what uh, happened at the Medemsley Detention Centre. Uh, first of all, Obviously, the independent uh, inquiry into child abuse is looking into his, uh, historic cases of abuse in uh, institutions, in state institutions, and uh, obviously they're doing that on a step-by-step -step basis in, in uh, uh, the areas that they're looking at. But I will, I will look at the issue. I was surprised at the statement she made that the Medems Lee um, detention centre cases weren't able to be covered by that inquiry, and I will certainly look at that issue. Finally, Colin Clark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, uh, along with Scottish colleagues, I was pleased to welcome the Prime Minister to Aberdeen on Friday. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Prime Minister will be aware that the SNP Scottish Government want to postpone devolved fat, fat powers, delay social security powers and have U-turned on the air departure tax. Does the Prime Minister agree it's time for new leadership in Scotland? It's time for Ruth Davidson in Butte House. Can I, can I absolutely agree with my honourable friend? What do we see from the SNP in government in, uh, in Scotland? That their powers, we gave them powers over uh, welfare payments, which they asked for, not used. They asked, it was an SNP manifesto commitment to cut air passenger duty. They have the power, they're not going to use it. But what are they using? They've used their power to change taxes so that people doing the same job in Scotland are being charged more tax than the same job south of the border. So when given the chance, when given the chance to help people, they reject it. When given the chance to take more money out of people's pockets, they take it. It's certainly time for Ruth Davidson in Butte House. Uh, urgent question, Mr. John Barron. Mr. Speaker, thank you for granting this urgent question. Um